welcome all in this session. What do we want to achieve uh, this uh, uh, in this in this uh, webinar is to share with you some fresh perspectives to consumer centricity. Um, what does it take for a company to truly think consumer centered and also act upon it? We have quite a number of different cases to highlight different dimensions uh, for what it takes to truly put consumers at the core of a company. So we believe you're never done with this. Whenever you think you're consumer centered, please think again. We won't um, lose any time in this session debating whether consumer centricity matters or not and why it would. Um, we just take it as a starting point. Um, companies today, they do understand that um, the ones who are most adaptive to change in their industry are the ones most likely to, to win. Um, and this is the main starting point of, of our session. So it's not about the why, it's about how consumers, uh, how companies can become more consumer centered. Mm -hmm. It now seems I have a small issue going to the next slides. Bear with us for a minute and we'll try to have this resolved. Yes, here we are. Um, if we take a look at different practices companies have in place to define and deliver great experiences, um, we see that there are different ways that all lead to, to Rome. Some companies are really mature in listening through social media or via Voice of the Customer programs. Other have via MPS programs ongoing feedback loops. Other do invest an awful lot of money and efforts in providing great um, service levels in all their direct uh, interaction with clients, uh, all with the right intentions, but let's be honest, do they really take, uh, make a difference? Um, one, often your current practice is exactly the same as your main competitors. So do you truly stand out through this? Not necessarily. Secondly, is it effectively impacting the loyalty of your customers? I guess also on many occasions the answer will be will be no. And we see that companies often have a very strong focus on managing their touch points. Communication touch points, service touch points, their products offline or dig digital, they have um, approaches to get ongoing feedback in on the current touch point experience. They take it at heart, they improve stuff, uh, they track satisfaction, they put incentives on certain uh, satisfaction targets. Um, of course, it's a relevant thing to do as a company uh, because you need your touch points as gateway to deliver experiences to, to the market. On the other hand, it's not necessarily the right perspective because it's a focus on your own touch point. It's still inward looking, not necessarily outside in. And let me give you an example of, of TUI. Um, you might know TUI. It's in Europe the leading air beach holiday company. And uh, they have more than 70,000 people on board, employees within their company, uh, that are all clearly trained and guided and supported to show the right behavior in order that um, they deliver satisfaction at all relevant touch points for the customers. So they're extremely mature in uh, managing customer satisfaction. Uh, they also ongoingly track it, they put um, targets on it, incentivizes both um, internal teams but also hotel partners and suppliers. So you would expect that all these efforts resonate um, well among customers, lead to higher satisfaction scores and as such impact strongly the actual business outcomes. But there in the end it seems there's, there's a disconnect. Uh, over time they have seen an increase in the relative impact of satisfaction on the actual financial results of company. And with this observation that came to us, they've asked us to further investigate this. So what we have done is a quite straightforward quantitative research project where at the start, together with the client, we have identified all touch points, all touch points between TUI and their customers in the whole journey. And here you see at the left, uh, their journey visualized, moving from the very early stages of looking for holiday inspiration, booking it, preparing to go, 
enjoy your actual holiday but also the afterplay when you return and want to live your holiday so the whole journey uh, was covered through all potential touch points within a survey we have measured satisfaction for each single touch point among recent customers but also measured the willingness to recommend TUI so MPS as the overall metric to assess the quality of the TUI experience strikingly only 22% of the overall TUI experience was uh, predicted by all, all touch points. So it's clear somehow TUI missed out on, on something. So it's clear uh, we should not focus too much and blindly on touch points. Touch points matter, but we better make sure we have the right touch points in place at the moments that really matter to our customers. And of course, not all moments are are equally important. Some are more, some are less important. And we also know that quite some companies they have kind of a gaze in looking at the moments that matter. So often they have kind of blind spots, moments that are really important to their customers, but is not recognized as such within, within the company. And let me give you one example of KLM, the Dutch airline company. In their customer experience tracking study, they noticed over time a decline in satisfaction on transfer experience. So transfer experience whenever you are in an airport between two connecting, connecting flights. Um, and they asked us to help them in defining opportunities to improve the transfer experience. So what did we do? We have set up a consumer consulting board. It's a closed group of frequent um, uh, travelers or frequent, frequent travelers of, of KLM who are often in transfer. We have asked them to take us along in their transfer experiences over a number of weeks. So we had given them tasks to um, block whenever they were in transfer, to take pictures of meaningful moments while being in transfer and add some depth why it was meaningful, what was positive, what was negative, what were frictions they experienced versus what were aspirations they were longing for. We had expected through the hundreds of pictures and stories we got that all of them would have been situated within the airport where the actual transfer happens. But remarkably, uh, quite a number of the observations we got were actually framed one step before when people were still in the incoming flight um, to the transfer airport. And when we dig a little deeper into these particular conversations and, and observations, we noticed that at that point of time, actually in the mind of the consumer, transfer and also transfer stress is, is kicking in. People start getting nervous. Will I be able to truly get my, my connection? Will I, be, will I be guided? Please give me some reassurance in, in this. So it was clear KLM had kind of a blind spot. The transfer experience is more than what happens in the airport it starts already when people are um, in the incoming in the incoming flight and a typical approach to um, define the moments of truth and also understand whether you have blind spots or not from a consumer perspective a journey mapping you just outline all key steps people go through when buying um, and using your products or services and here in the example of KLM, we have outlined many, many different specific moments who go through over major phases like booking, preparing your travel, going to the airport, uh, your actual departure at the airport, your in-flight experience before you touch down in the transfer airport. It becomes more interesting if we add emotionality to all these different moments. And here we outline a very simplified emotionality curve where we see that there's really a lot of negative emotions people feel experience when in transfer but emotionality already really goes dramatically down in in flight and in this project then we had mapped the different touch points that KLM has in place uh, to help people in transfer um, like signage like the transfer desk but they all only um, came in at the actual airport, while true ideation we did with uh, the participants in our consumer consulting board, we were able to um, 
help defining new touch points, new touch points that kick in earlier in plane and are now also um, have been implemented by KLM. So until now we have talked about the travel and the tourism industry, but the um, concept of journey mapping can equally apply um, within other environments and other industries, like an FMCG. Uh, I guess you all know Chupa Chup, famous candy brand, um, but maybe it's not that big of a brand as you might imagine. They uh, are not in the position compared to their main competitors to build their brand through above the line and always be on air. They don't have the pockets for doing so. So somehow they have to be a little smarter in the go-to-market than their opponents. And to get there, they also have done a journey mapping exercise. Mapping over a week's time, within a day, what are the different buying occasions for youngsters, their main target group, um, for snacks and, and candy. And of course, they came up with uh, quite a number of, of different buying occasions, but one in particular proved to be most potent to them. It was the after school moment between three and five o'clock in the afternoon when school is out, uh, kids um, want to spare, want to still have some fun time with, uh, with their friends, hang around, buy some snack, buy a candy, and also enjoy it while commuting back, back home. Based on the strength and the potential of this particular occasion, um, Chupa Chup completely moved away from above the line to a much more focused go-to-market approach where they installed new communication touch points that are completely focused on the time and the place of this particular buying occasion. So this is our first layer in our consumer centricity model. Of course, it makes sense to um, improve the satisfaction on your touch point, but please be sure that you have the right touch point experiences in place to deliver at the moments that matter most for your consumers. If we take a look at the second layer of our model, there we have a strong focus on the needs. Why do people buy a product and services? Um, why, what are they after in, in using them? And if you take a look at more recent theories in consumer experience, like the jobs to be done theory, like a practice of service design, that it's also all focused on the needs, the why. Let me give you one example how that somehow changes thinking within a company. Let's say you are a manufacturer of this electric drill and your aim is to improve the experience of your customers using this electric drill. So I ask you, what would you be? What would you do? You are in charge of this company. What would you do to improve the experience of this drill? So any, any thoughts, please share in the chat. What could this company do? Maria Lane, a good box to keep it in. Indeed. That's that's one that's one element. Other things we could do. I guess we could make this drill more powerful. We could maybe make it a little lighter and, and handy to work with and make it portable. So uh, uh, detach the uh, the power cord. Joao is also I think that's a soft handle. It's made with rubber, indeed. Um, and I guess all of these are relevant product specs to, to look after. Um, but maybe it's not the right perspective because these are all product specs. Um, maybe we should take a look at what people are after when using this drill. Actually, I just want to drill a hole in the wall. This is what we need to optimize. Whatever we can do to optimize this, this need. And maybe even the, um, the need is more aspirational. This company might be in the business of nostalgia. Um, helping people to attach really warm pictures of their family, of memorable moments on the wall in their, uh, in their living room. So think about the needs, not about 
the blunt product specs. Let's go back to, to KLM and the transfer experience story. Um, if you have been in transfer, not for just one or two hours, where it's about rushing to the to the right gate, but whenever you're in transfer for maybe five to six hours, I guess you have all felt before it's about yeah killing killing boredom. Um, and KLM has understood this and has activated within the setting of transfer experience an extremely important need, overarching need when it comes to travel. If you travel, you want to discover. You want to discover new places, new cities. You want to meet up with with new people. Um, and how have they done so? Whenever you are in transfer at Schiphol, their main hub in Amsterdam, for more than five hours you can register for layover with a local. That means that when arriving, a local comes to the airport, collects you, and together you take the train to uh, Amsterdam Central. And the, the local is your local tour guide. He or she takes you along and um, goes to his or her favorite spots. You discover the city in a very personal way. You meet up a local. Uh, but at the time you have to uh, leave for, uh, for your flight, the local also takes you along back to the airport. So what has KLM done here? Activate an extremely important need when it comes to travel. At the time, people would not expect this is even, even possible. If you also go back to our TUI story, where actually the situation they were in was that their very mature touchpoint satisfaction program somehow fails in delivering the right business results. We were asked to dig a little deeper and help them to understand what else beyond touchpoint satisfaction drives the overall TUI experience. And to do so, we have set up a consumer consulting board. In four different countries, we had uh, always 50 people within the category who were somewhere at some stage of a journey in, in buying or having um, an Air Beach holiday. And we asked them again to share their stories, to take us along in their experiences. The screenshot I show here is of the consumer consulting board we had in France. Um, um, for their local brand Marmara and this is just one thread, one thread between one participant and our moderator on one of the 18 different research activities. I want to show this to just highlight the, the richness and the depth of the inputs we get. Rich stories, a lot of context, emotionality, supported by a lot of visuals and based on this kind of data we are in a good position to derive consumer needs and in total um, we have then identified 36 potential relevant consumer needs that could play across the whole customer journey of TUI. And we took these needs and have added them to a new quantitative study where we did not only measure it among recent customers, touchpoint satisfaction, but also the extent they felt that TUI performed on these consumer needs. And by adding the needs, we were able to lift the predictive power of um, the model from 22 to 60 percent and this is dramatically important it actually means that for a company like TUI but applicable far beyond only TUI it's really crucial that you have better in your competitors the ability to understand consumers and of course it's not only about understanding it's also delivering upon that for a company like TUI which is that big multi-country 70,000 people within the company who all take small and big decisions that will lead to uh, certain experiences, it is truly important that they have a good understanding of these different needs. And TUI has embedded them in their KPI system. So since one year, they have a new customer experience tracking study where ongoingly recent customers are asked to rate to we on the extent they performed against this kind of different needs. So these have been now set as KPIs, uh, continuously tracked with targets. So this is one approach to make sure that the employees are really engaged in this first approach. So this is our second layer of our, of our model. Uh, it's not only what we do that matters, but more importantly, the extent we um, fulfill key needs for our customers. 
needs that are somehow residing within the boundaries of our category, why people are buying or using our products and services. But maybe as a brand, we can be more ambitious. Uh, can we somehow exceed the boundaries of our category and become more meaningful in the life of our customers beyond time and place of consuming our products? So can we ease our life? Can we improve their life? And why is this kind of an ambition we all should, should have? Because people are only consumers a very small part of the day. Just look at yourself on an ordinary day um, during the week. You wake up, you are in rush to uh, have your kids at school, to be at work at time, um, hopefully have a very productive day and have some joy at work. Then again, it is kind of a rush to have everything sorted out also family-wise and hopefully there's some time left for entertainment or to enjoy good, good company. And yes, in between, there is some time left to buy stuff and consume stuff, but it's only a very small part of the day uh, where actually this is happening. The rest of the day, we're just ordinary people. So what can we do to improve one's life or ease one's life? And I have two small examples, not too big, but two small examples that hopefully show that it's really accessible for a company to address that level as well. One example is for Visit Britain. Visit Britain is the organization that, on behalf of the British government, attracts international travels to Great Britain. A very important market to them is China. And now, I want to ask yourself to close your eyes and picture yourself, Chinese tourists visiting London. What do you see? So please share in the chat the kind of picture you have of Chinese tourists visiting London. What do you see? They're taking pictures of everything absolutely and i guess of all the highlights but also selfies um and they do not travel alone they do travel in group and indeed they have a selfie stick and i guess we can also add that they hop on hop off the bus from one touristic highlight to to another visit britain is confident that this picture will evaporate over time. Um, the future Chinese traveler will travel differently. Why? We all know there is a Chinese middle class rapidly coming up and they are different in life. They attach much more importance in being independent and it reflects also the way they love to travel. Unfortunately, whenever they go to London, they lack actually solid English English skills. So that makes it still, they travel in, in group um, as the way we picture it today. But Visit Britain wants to help them overcoming this. And they have launched a campaign um, that taps into a very small but strong observation of communication styles in, in China, where there's a habit of uh, giving um, locations giving whatever a certain very poetic nickname and they have implemented this uh, in their communication but also in local tour guide material in london like the shard now becomes a tower to pluck the stars and of course also communicated in in chinese and as such they want to help um, people want to travel independent to start doing so and move away from being somehow locked up in, in group group travel. Let's move to a totally different industry of finance. This picture of the boy on top is a picture of Ben. He's my oldest of uh, three boys. And Ben recently turned seven. So we find the time right to um, start talking about the value and the virtues of money and to educate him on what it takes to save money, to spend money. Uh, and as I guess in every single household happens, we bought him a piggy bank, this very beautiful big pink 
piggy bank with the idea of giving him one euro of pocket money, pocket money every single Sunday. Unfortunately, we got stuck in good intentions because on Sundays, yes, Ben comes to me and wants to collect his, his one euro, but I open my wallet and most often I don't have any, I don't, I don't have any cash money in. And if I have so, have so, it's maybe just a banknote of 50 euro. So it's not working out as we're moving into a cashless society. ASB is a bank in New Zealand. They have taken this on board and they um, have introduced a new uh, piece of technology. On one hand, it's a device, uh, kind of a digital piggy bank. Now it more looks like an elephant than a pig. And it has a screen on its belly visualizing um, the money this little boy has saved until now. Um, that's a device. The essence of the whole concept lies actually in the interaction between kid and, and parent. And parent. If this little boy want to get his uh, pocket money, mom has to be really close to him and his uh, piggy bank and she has to swipe it. She cannot just remotely transfer money, no, she has to swipe it. And she can also enter together with the boys in her iPhone or her smartphone um, different saving goals. So as such, there are different triggers for starting conversations between this kid and its mom um, on, on money. And as such, a bank somehow uh, exceeds the typical boundaries of what we would expect from a bank and a financial institution. And they come up with uh, new ideas, new technology to add more meaning to one's, one's life. So this is the third level of our model. And I guess you already feel that trying to provide really value in one's life um, will be much more firmly executed uh, and truly supported by the whole company if it's rooted within your brand purpose, the bigger why, why you are in business as a company. And naturally, ideally, that should de be defining everything you do. So this makes we have now our full, full picture. And the outtake we want to share here with you is that if you want to work towards a more consumer-centered company, you need to think and act more holistically. It's about thinking at the left. Um, yes, of course, you have to understand what are the moments that matter most. and Put emphasis on that. Make sure that you have a good understanding of the key needs at these moments, and maybe you can exceed that level and try to ease and improve one's one's life. But there's also an organizational perspective um, to it. So of course you have to manage your touch points. Make sure whatever you do is uh, deeply rooted within your brand purpose, and take on board of all of this your employees. Um, they are often in many cases the bottleneck there's some good thinking companies some strong strategies but not really executed well because of a lack of engaging engagement among your employees and let's dig a little deeper in in this we believe that getting there getting there and engaging your employees you need to go step by step first you need to win the hearts of of your staff. You have to establish a culture of consumer centricity and gain time over time buy in for consumer centric thinking. That's one. Secondly, it's about winning their minds, making sure yeah, that you feed them with the right consumer inspiration, with the right consumer insights that they can use to improve their plans, product roadmaps, go to market plans. And thirdly, put strategy into action. Make sure that. Uh, your employees are supported, empowered to really act upon the key insights that are known and well understood within the company. And of course, there are different ways to win these hearts, win these minds and get into actions. And I want to share with you two examples of insights clients who have done so in, in different ways. The first one is Philips Lighting. I guess all familiar with Philips, Philips Lighting, one of the leading global uh, lighting bulb manufacturers. But in the last couple of years, they are faced with an extremely rapidly changing industry. Um, Philips Lighting, but also every single competitor, is 
um, moving from traditional bulbs to LED technology, but makes actually they just burn for 30,000 or 50,000 hours. They're never to be replaced anymore. So they, they, they move away from a typical market that's driven by replacement. Um, and products are not dumb anymore. Um, lighting is not um, exclusively anymore controlled by dumb switches uh, mounted on the wall. Now increasingly people use their smartphones to control their lighting or they install smart sensors at their place and then as such they got integrated in bigger systems, got integrated with entertainment, integrated with security systems one have and that also leads to a completely new kind of competitive set therein. So now they start competing with companies like Nest and Apple and Samsung and insurance companies. So this comes with quite some challenges for, for the company. They're fully aware and the response is extremely simple from top management. It's twofold saying one, instead of focusing on technologies, we have to focus on consumers. Secondly, without, uh, before we brought products to the market, now we have to bring relevant lighting experiences to the market. Of course, it's easily set, but how do you make this happen in, in a globally operating company? It all starts with consumer-centered thinking. And this is the model that has been developed by Philips Lighting in collaboration with Insights Consulting that covers all key consumer needs within the lighting category and with the lettering in it. At the bottom, these are consumer needs that are relevant to provide basic quality lamps and lights. If we go up, we also uh, go to kind of a higher level of, of needs. Within imagination, it's all about the fact that as a consumer, you can do whatever you want with lighting to develop the experiences you want at your place, indoors, outdoors. How is this used to um, manage um, their portfolio of products? Current propositions are mapped in, in this, so are linked to, to consumer needs, but also thinking about future propositions. It's not about first taking a look at technology they have and see uh, how it fits then here within the pyramid. Now it's about understanding what are the key needs that show most potential in the future to address and they then start developing uh, propositions to it. So it's the backbone for their proposition thinking. This is all thinking, but of course now the hard thing starts. How do you make sure the whole thing acts upon it? And as such, we should make sure that all these just ordinary people become kind of heroes within the company and they're highly valued um, partners for different different teams in different in different offices of Philips Lighting. And the enabler to make this happen is their consumer consulting board called the Light Stories Community. That is a consumer consulting board that um, runs um, structurally so these consumers are readily available to um, be involved in small and big everyday decisions to make sure that on all these capabilities consumers or uh, the, the, the staff members start really engaging with consumers we have done quite some additional efforts beyond let's say the basic market market research at the start all of this has been positioned not as research but as a very important consumer centricity program that neatly fits within an important strategic challenge of, of the company. Key stakeholders were chosen and exclusively um, involved um, throughout a series of, of workshops. So they are part of a bigger wave and we make them somehow the big supporters and champions within the bigger organization. And of course, all of this um, required quite some time with these people, but we also gave them quite some short-term, very hands-on return so they can use it in their um, ongoing projects and work as well. Something else we did to win to win hearts was just show the enthusiasm over the consumer participants because enthusiasm is contagious, but also it works in both ways. Equally, the enthusiasm from uh, the staff members at Philips Lighting during a workshop was captured and also shared with, with consumers. To win the minds, 
we had quite a challenge because so many different teams at different places at different times all should feel inspired by consumers and of course we had the right content we had thousands of consumer stories and a lot of pictures we had the right consumer insights but it had to be readily available in the right format for all these instances um, and of course we as research agency were not sufficiently scalable to always just come in and present our findings to overcome this we have developed a consumer story dashboard which is a digital application that in a very smart way unlocks all consumer stories and uses within Philips Lighting can then smartly filter to the observation that matter for them for instance on one particular use case one particular segment one particular market one particular inside platform and they got the right inspiration at hand which means that within this whole program we move away from typical quant validation research where we say hey team your t your ideas and your concepts they they make sense or they do not make sense to helping them in spotting uh, opportunities by providing inspiration and then the last the last stage how we help them to get into action based on all this thinking is through the consumer consulting board through 48 hour challenges small quick and very tactile research activities on the board we are there to help them out in everyday decision making in crafting ideas improving concepts but also in going to the market that's Philips lighting if you take a look at the other case that's that's Denon Denon the well-known dairy brand who wants to build better understanding for the US team of their opportunities in the healthy and wellness space and for that purpose we have set up their shopper consulting boards focusing on people who do shop healthy healthy foods and again these people took us along their shopping experiences and not only the actual shopping also the preparing before they go to they go to a shop but also in consuming healthy healthy products and in back of um, all the inputs we collected from these healthy shoppers we were able one to develop customer journey of healthy shopping and define the key key moments but also build a good understanding of the key inside platforms key needs that then matter at these at these key moments we had an awful lot of findings many insights different inside platforms that had to be communicated in a powerful way internally because key stakeholders were ought to truly understand and grasp these inside platforms and make it their own so to help them internalizing all the research content we started off with some workshops workshops where we use different techniques and one of the techniques was an observation museum station where we had gathered um, some strong quotes stories and pictures always linked to one particular inside platform and then participants of the workshop could add their own observations to the uh, observation already collected from from the board around that one insight one other activity we did um, within within the workshop around the inside platforms was ideating not just coming up with new product ideas out of the blue but now clearly clearly linked to one of the main inside platforms that we have found through through the board so making sure that the right people at Denon were internalizing all the research content was one next challenge was even bigger to us make sure that they start acting upon it and therefore we have introduced a consumer activation studio so what is a consumer activation studio as you see here it's a digital platform that connects people within a company around consumer observations that's a core ID how does it work on the one hand there are different inspiration walls there's one wall linked to an internal project or a wall in this case linked to an inside platform and within a wall there are different inspiration tiles a tile always unlocks one consumer observation uh, very short snappy often visual 
and people can like it, they can share it, and they can comment on it, and can, they can start ideating on it. But they can even add also their own tiles with their own observations that are linked to that project or that inside platform. When we run the Consumer Activation study, Studio for, for a while at, at Denon, um, we got some great feedback. On the one hand, this is a completely new channel to disclose market research. They find it really appealing and engaging, and we saw that uh, more people took more time to explore and discover research content. That is one. Secondly, by doing it themselves, instead of just um, backward leaning, listening to presentation, they had much more aha moments. Um, secondly, um, as it is a platform uh, that is also fed by the peers you have in your company, like here Nancy, the shield, who is the internal communication manager at Denon in the US, who is posting this picture of her, her daughter with a story um, um, making yogurt per face. Of course, that's fun to see this kind of story and see a picture of um, the kid of your, of your colleague much more than of a consumer you don't, you're not uh, in the know of. So that also makes it much more personal and people are more engaged in using the platform. When it comes also then to, to reach, we notice that we got relatively more reach amongst people who were mo most distant from consumer. 30% more reach among um, employees who stated at the start that they have relatively little consumer feeling and even 230% more reach among the ones who said that in their role they don't have any direct consumer contact. So two different stories, Philips Lighting versus Denon, but in both cases there were different triggers to win the hearts within the company, so gain buy-in for consumer centricity, uh, win their minds, make sure that people start working upon consumer inspiration and insights, uh, but not only stick to thinking, also moving into, into action. So looking back at our, our full, full model, um, with the hearts, mind, action have um, provided some more thinking on what can we do to make sure we have the employees engaged, as they're often the main, the main bottleneck. But again, it is a multi-dimensional story. Um, it's about thinking, it's about acting, and it comes with different, different layers. So whenever you think you're done, please think again.